it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Hello, welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barrett. I'm Chaz Lichardello. We're at a new time for a new year and a new presidency, and we have a whole hour to talk about the events of the week. Our guest tonight, former presidential speechwriter James Fallows and former Senator Carol Mosley Braun. We're going to look at the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the impeachment, the executive actions, the Senate. So much going on. Let's get into it. President Biden used his inaugural address this week to chart a course forward, express his hope for the future, but also acknowledge the challenges of the moment, which he described as a winter of peril. This is a great nation. We are good people. And over the centuries, through storm and strife, in peace and in war, we've come so far. But we still have far to go. We'll press forward with speed and urgency, for we have much to do in this winter of peril and significant possibilities. Much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. Implying his predecessor did otherwise, he pledged to try and unite Americans rather than divide them. Biden at times was also quite informal. We will get through this together, together. Look, folks, all my colleagues I serve with in the House and the Senate up here, we all understand the world is watching, watching all of us today. Now, I don't know if the word folks has ever appeared in an inaugural address before. And at times, certainly President Biden sounded, well, less like a president, more like a reassuring parent. Look, he certainly was trying to reach out to people, no doubt about that, as you would hope a president would with their inaugural speech. Mm. But it wasn't just the usual pieties and motherhood statements. Like, for instance, take this part, where Biden was speaking about the benefits of unity. We can join forces... Stop the shouting and lower the temperature. For without unity, there is no peace, only bitterness and fury. No progress, only exhausting outrage. No nation, only a state of chaos. Now, I don't think that wording at the end was mm. an accident, because Trump supporters have spent the last four years talking about focusing on the nation instead of the globalists. And now Biden is saying, unless we unite, you have no nation. I thought that was pretty clever. Mm. I also thought this was clever. To all those who did not support us, let me say this. Hear me out as we move forward. Take a measure of me and my heart. If you still disagree, so be it. That's democracy. That's America. The right to dissent peaceably within the guardrails of our republic is perhaps this nation's greatest strength. Yet hear me clearly, disagreement must not lead to disunion. Once again, the political world has spent decades developing a culture where disagreement and disunion have become synonyms for each other. It only takes a mild difference of opinion on social media to unleash the hordes of flying monkeys. Mm. We both know that. Uh, and Biden is telling both the right and the left to chill out about their differences of opinion. And I think that is an admirable, if probably futile, hill to die on. Well, he certainly has to try because, of course, he's, he gave that speech on the same steps of the Capitol building where two weeks to the day earlier an armed insurrection tried to capture and kill members of Congress, including Republicans and Democrats. So there may be unity in this moment saying, well, we may disagree on some policy issues, the age that you should get Medicare or the rate of the t corporate tax rate. But surely we can agree that after you hold an election, that result... When legal should be certified, we should move on. We shouldn't have people trying to stop the working of government. And the fact that you can disagree without being disunited is a really important distinction, of course, if it works. Now, it was 1976, in the aftermath of Watergate, that then-candidate, about to become President Jimmy Carter, promised the American people he would never lie to them. And in this week's inaugural, Joe Biden, who had been a senator for four years by the time Jimmy Carter had said that, kind of echoed that sentiment. Take a look. Before God and all of you, I give you my word. 
I will always level with you. And again, without ever mentioning his predecessor, Donald Trump, by name, clearly the inference is, unlike the last guy, the fact that Biden felt the need to say, I will be level with you, says, I know the guy that just left was not. And that's, that's an important kind of flag in, to be uh, planting the sand there. And as you say, there's parallels with Richard Nixon and mm. Jimmy Carter there yeah. as well, even though they weren't directly after each other, they were close together. Mm. But before we get too starry-eyed about all this, I thought there was a moment in the speech that was a little more realist than we often give Biden credit for. It was this moment here. This is also about his quest for unity. I know speaking of unity can sound to some like a foolish fantasy these days. I know the forces that divide us are deep and they are real. But I also know they are not new. Through Civil War, the Great Depression, World War, 9-11, through struggle, sacrifice, and setbacks, our better angels have always prevailed. In each of these moments, enough of us, enough of us have come together to carry all of us forward. And we can do that now. Now, to get that bit in the end, when tough times have occurred before, Enough of us have come together to carry all of us forward, and we can do that now. In other words, he's acknowledging that all of America are not going to unite, that there's a group of people who are unreachable to him, but he's saying if enough of America, i.e. the left and the moderates, come together, that might be enough to carry everyone. Now, that's the first time I've heard Biden actually acknowledge, mm. albeit implicitly, that some people are unreachable, and that's OK. To me, that was an encouraging concept. What do you think, though? Do you think this message resonated? Well, I think... We'll see if it's resonated, but it certainly says that Joe Biden is a better politician than Hillary Clinton ever was, because mm. when she tried to uh, say the same thing, she talked about a basket of deplorables. That's true. Uh, yes. When Mitt Romney talked yeah. about it in 2012, he referred to the 47% that he would be unable to reach. This is a clever formulation by Joe Biden, because he's basically saying to Republicans and Trump supporters, you do not have to choose between the marauding crowd at the Capitol building, the insurgents... Uh, or a Democrat and a, and a socialist and a, you know, you don't have, th these aren't the extremes. You can join me in the, in the sensible centre. That's Joe Biden's message of moderation right now. And this could be the moment before it because clearly Americans are tired and they're not just tired, they're sick and tired right now, literally. Yeah, that's fair. Look, I thought Biden did quite well overall, I have to say, although probably not as well as CNN's David Shalian thought he did because Shalian seemed to be right into Joe Biden this week. Those lights that are that are just shooting out from the Lincoln Memorial uh, along the reflecting pool, it, it, I look, it's like almost uh, extensions of Joe Biden's arms embracing America. <laughs> He's loving his <laughs> Biden. But, OK, what about the negatives, though? Because personally, I was a little nervous about how much of a deal that Biden made about taking on domestic terrorism. I mean, obviously, we don't like domestic terrorism, but Biden's had a real taste in the past for trampling over civil liberties to fight terror. In fact, after 9-11, Joe Biden went around boasting to reporters about how he drafted a terrorism bill in the 1990s that was exactly like the Patriot Act, and that was what the Patriot Act was based on. He was so proud of that, he said it to reporters at least seven times. Now, bear in mind, the Patriot Act was widely seen as a horrendous bill for civil liberties, and Biden couldn't embrace it any harder. So I'm a little worried about where this new attempt to defeat domestic terrorism might be heading. What about you? Do you have any concerns? Well, it will ultimately come down to the sort of rhetoric that is being used. It's one thing to declare war on something that doesn't fight back, mm. you know, in a literal sense, like a pandemic mm. or um, broadly crime or mm. war on corruption or war on waste. You don't want to declare war on people who want a war who are these domestic terrorists mm. that are talking about civil war. They're talking about, well, Alabama and Kentucky and Texas should all secede. You know, we should, we should go our separate ways again. No, you don't want to declare war on them. You just want to tone things down and then knock on their door in the middle of the night and take them off to face trial mm. uh, for their crimes, if indeed they have committed crimes. But bear in mind as well, talking the 1990s, Merrick Garland, the incoming Attorney General of the United States, uh, he cut his teeth after the 1995 Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing, prosecuting the likes of Timothy McVeigh. Uh, Merrick Garland is going to be very, very handy in using the law, existing laws, to crack down on not just 
Trump supporters, everyday Trump supporters, you could leave them alone, but uh, the people who would join militias, the Proud Boys, the Oath Takers, the ultra-nationalist neo-Nazi fringe that Trump embraced, but Biden is now saying, no, no, they're not us, get them away, they're a threat to our democracy, they're a threat to our society. Let's make a pariah of those people, because at the end of the day, there's not a lot more that is unpatriotic than saying, we should leave the United States because we don't agree with Joe Biden. That cool. Yeah. <laughs> now, for more on this week's inaugural address and the task ahead for President Biden, we're joined by James Fallows, former speechwriter for Jimmy Carter, now staff writer at The Atlantic. Jim Fallows, welcome back to Planet America. John, it is so great to be back on the air with you and Chaz, so thank you. What did you make of Joe Biden's inaugural address? Was it one for the ages or one that'll soon be forgotten? I think that as a piece of rhetoric, there was nothing special about it, but that was the point. It was authentic to the person and the moment. And I think while people may struggle to remember any particular line from it, uh, perhaps that America won't lead from the example of its power, but the power of its example, which is a little cutesy, or Biden saying that his whole soul was in the, uh, the, the struggle to uh, remake America. I think as a political and civic and moral gesture, it was a success. It was true to him as a person. It was true to this moment. And so I thought it was actually good. What's a president actually trying to achieve with a speech like this? What are the measures by which you grade it? Every inaugural address boils down to two stories. One is the story of who we are, the country, and the other is the story of who I am as the new leader. And I think that, that the the measure of success in these speeches is whether they can match those stories. And the story of who we are is a country with tremendous problems, this disaster of a pandemic, the associated economic collapse, um, the, the crisis in climate, uh, the crisis of sort of political stability, all those things. But so the, a country with tremendous problems, but that has been under stress before and that, that has found ways to kind of uh, make itself better. The, the wonderful young poet who was speaking, Amanda Gorman, was saying the country is not broken but unfinished. That was sort of an expression of the same thing. Then Biden's presentation of who I am, who he is, is a person who was plain and humble and empathetic and aware of the unfairness of fate, you know, in his own life with all the various tragedies that he has endured in his own person endured in his own personal life, having a moment of recollection for the 400,000 Americans who have died of the pandemic, of including presidents of different parties, of symbols of, of unity. So I think the, the success is if Biden can present himself as a person whose traits match the needs of this moment. That doesn't mean that he's going to get his legislation through, doesn't mean all the political battles will go away, but I think it is as successful a start as you could be 24 hours into his administration. Now, Jim, I certainly heard echoes of your old boss when Joe Biden said, I will always level with you. Is this a Carter-esque, post-Watergate kind of moment we're seeing now? I think that is a very important parallel. And I was um, thinking that, that the one inaug the inaugural address that I actually worked on was Jimmy Carter's back in 1977, where the first words he said as a newly sworn in president were thanking Gerald Ford for what he had done, as Carter put it, to heal our land, which meant um, pardoning Richard Nixon, very controversial at the time. It may have, that may have allowed Carter to beat Gerald Ford and Carter w w was aware of that. But Carter was essentially setting a moral example for a country that had dealt with a lot of moral failures in Vietnam, with Watergate, with Nixon's resignation, and so on. And there is a real moral crisis among many other crises for the U.S. now. So I think Biden was trying to present himself not as a fancy leader, but as a steady leader, as somebody who would do his best to to, uh, to level with people. So again, I think that was, it doesn't mean everything's going to be smooth sailing, but it was the right way to start, I thought. Jim, there have also been comparisons made to JFK's inaugural speech. JFK said, we observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. Whereas Biden said, Today we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate but of a cause, the cause of democracy. Okay, so as a former speechwriter, do you think those echoes are intentional and what should we take from that? 
Um, I, I think they are intentional and aspirational on, on Biden's part. You know, when he was a, he was 19 or 20 years old when um, John F. Kennedy, the only other Catholic ever to have been elected president, uh, was coming onto the scene. So, of course, the ideal of young Joe Biden's life all the way along would have been to be the next JFK. And everybody would like to have that kind of glamour and, um, and uh, you know, ret rhetorical pizzazz. Of course, Kennedy was the youngest person ever elected president. Uh, Biden is now the oldest person ever elected president. The person who was the youngest senator is now the oldest president ever. And so I think he was wise not to try too hard to sort of copy the Kennedy flourish. But also it's worth noting for uh, an overseas uh, audience that why American presidents harp on this um, peaceful transfer of power business. It's because, you know, in a parliamentary system that happens more kind of naturally, and as we've seen the last month, it's not a guaranteed thing. <laughs> and so it is a, it, it is why most presidents uh, note that, and I think Biden was, was all the more emphatic now because it actually matters. Jim, you talked about the function of the speech being in part to describe where America is at, but also who Joe Biden is. There has been over the last two years a kind of a question mark, is Joe Biden winning because he is simply not Trump or that he somehow represents an anti-Trump, that he is everything that Donald Trump is not? What's your view? I think that's a very good distinction. And I think across normal divisions on partisan lines in the UF, U.S., if you're not talking about the people who are actually in the Capitol building two weeks ago rioting and trying to uh, capture congressmen and con congressional leaders, if you accept the people who are really the lunatic and insurrectionist fringe, I think there is a wide sense of national relief right now. Relief that you don't have to worry what the next tweet is going to be and the next nutty thing that's going to happen and the next revving up of the most disruptive and dysfunctional aspects of national life. So I think that for a while, it seemed as if Joe Biden, uh, early in the 2020 campaign, he wasn't young and glamorous like um, Pete Buttigieg. He wasn't a actuarially new figure like Kamala Harris or Cory Booker, although he is as the old, oldest person. He wasn't a sort of hard-edged progressive like Bernie Sanders or, or Elizabeth Warren. He was a steady, familiar, figure. And I think that seemed to be a drawback for him until his victory in the South Carolina primary, thanks to James Clyburn, thanks to the African-American vote, which uh, did save the nation in South Carolina. And I think that that just normality and familiarity and sort of range of, oh, that's just Joe, you know, sort of, you know, what the up and the, the, the maximum and the minimum is, is from him. I think that that was an important part of his success in the general election campaign against Trump and a kind of, I imagine, some limited honeymoon he'll have now. Now, Biden spoke a lot, not just about unity, but also about truth. And I think it's pretty hard to take that not as a reference to Trump and his supporters. So doesn't that kind of work against Biden's expressed desire to create unity? I thought it was a useful distinction for him to make. He said that he wants to listen to people who didn't vote for him. He'll make his case to them. He'll try to represent the whole public. But he was saying there's a difference. Um, there's some different category of people who are pushing lies for profit and people who are trying to attack democracy itself, not the, Dem the Democratic Party or the Democrat Party, as they call it, but the democratic process. And so I thought that was a useful marker that he wasn't going to just say, oh, can't we all get along in a uh, Pollyanna-ish way, that he recognized that democracy itself had some enemies and those were part of the adversaries he need needed to take on. So I thought that was a kind of not, it was a sort of subtweet in a useful way of saying he knew what the problem he was going to run into was and he was laying down that marker. A final question, Jim, for you on the future of now former President Donald Trump. What is your expectation? Will he stay very much at the centre of the political debate or do you think he will slowly fade away? I think Trumpism is a longer term problem for us. I dare to think that Donald Trump is a rapidly deflating figure like unto one of those Trump balloons 
that we've seen at the parades that runs into a branch. He doesn't have a way to get his, his bile out every single day. And I think he's gonna spend a lot of his time in the legal process in the, in the time ahead. So I, I, I resist making predictions about Donald Trump, but it seems to me he is a waning asset, whereas his people uh, are there to be dealt with for a while. James Fellows, so good to have you back on Planet America. Thank you. It's always a delight. I hope to see you in person in Australia someday again. Now, you might have noticed a little bit of talk recently about... My first 100 days. And President Biden has got a long to-do list in those first 100 days. He'll ask all Americans to wear face masks for his first 100 days in office. Your first 100 days. What are, you, what are your priorities going to be in those first days? Masking, vaccinations, opening schools. These are the three key goals for my first 100 days. Presidential appointments made within the first 100 days. Joe Biden says in his first 100 days he'd like to send to Congress uh, an immigration bill. But all this talk of a president's first 100 days is not new. When you think about what he's started, it's been a huge, uh, hugely successful first 100 days. In 100 days, Barack Obama has moved faster than any president in generations. Today marks our 100th day of working together for the American people. In the first 100 days of the administration, Mrs. Clinton has been doing, I think, a little better than Mr. Clinton. So where did this seemingly arbitrary yardstick of a president's first 100 days come from? Why not 50 days, three months, or their first year? Well, it was Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt who came to office in 1933, promising to lift America out of the Great Depression by ending government's hands-off approach. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. And it also helped that he was promising to repeal the prohibition of alcohol. Once in office, FDR delivered occasional radio addresses or fireside chats to keep the American people informed about the progress he was making. The president wants to come into your home and sit at your fireside for a little fireside chat. He knew major change needed an educated populace. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumours or guesses. It was in his third such fireside address that Roosevelt reflected on what he called the crowding events of the hundred days which had been devoted to the starting of the wheels of the New Deal. And a lot had happened in those first 100 days. Roosevelt signed into law no fewer than 15 pieces of legislation including federal unemployment benefits and the Cullen-Harrison Act. It permits the sale of three and two-tenths percent beer and wine after April 6th. And in 23 states, the return of the foaming liquid at five cents a glass is assured. Five cents for a beer, although manufacturing workers were only making about 18 bucks a week in those days, assuming they even had a job. FDR also signed into law the massive Tennessee Valley Authority Act, which did everything from generating jobs and electricity to alleviating flooding and poverty. Of course, such poverty as this is not universal in the valley. But it exists, and all too frequently. Some historians think FDR borrowed the notion of the 100 days from the period known as... Saint Germain. In 1815, the 100 days from Napoleon's return from exile to his final defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. The idea was a lot can happen in a short amount of time. But it is worth noting that only two or three of the pieces of legislation that FDR signed in those early months were the result of any White House initiative. Most of those bills had been working their way through Congress for months, even years. And Roosevelt's most significant achievements, including Social Security, were still ahead of him. So, in a way, it is an inflated record. Maybe, as someone once said, the whole 100 days thing is... Not very meaningful. And perhaps President Biden shouldn't be held to... The ridiculous standard of the first 100 days. Hey, when you're right, you're right. So, Joe Biden began his presidency this week with a flurry of activity. Within hours of taking the oath of office, he signed the first of more than 50 executive orders that he plans to issue over the next 10 days. Some of the executive actions I'm going to be signing today are going to 
help change the course of the COVID crisis, and we're going to combat climate change in a way that we haven't done so far, and advance racial equity and support other underserved communities. We're going to rebuild our economy as well. And these are just all starting points. So a bit to do. First, a mask mandate. It's limited to areas the president controls, though, like federal property and interstate commerce. And he has challenged Americans to wear masks for the next 100 days, but he can't insist on it. But with the stroke of a pen, President Biden has ended border wall construction. He's ended Trump's travel ban from seven Muslim countries. He's rejoined the Paris Climate Treaty and the World Health Organization. And he announced America's top infectious diseases expert, Dr Anthony Fauci, will head the US delegation to the WHO and say sorry. President Biden then cancelled the Keystone XL oil pipeline and ordered a review of the reversal of 100 Trump environmental actions. And then Biden issued an order to prevent workplace discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. All done in the space of a few short minutes. That was a certain flurry of activity to, uh, I guess, convince people that things can happen when you vote a new guy in. And this seems to be the way the presidency is going these days. We saw Trump do the same thing, saw Obama do the same thing, where they forget 100 days, it's over 10 days now, where they just sign lots and lots of executive orders and just reverse what the dude before them did. Right. Just flip back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. But there is one other aspect that Joe Biden can take advantage of in this regard, and that is there's something called the Congressional Review Act, which not a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. um, and what it, what it does is... For all the regulations uh, that, that Trump put forward in the last 60 legislative days of his administration, now 60 days doesn't sound like much, it can actually be 60 legislative days can stretch months. over... Months. Yeah, months. Six months, mm. nine months sometimes. Uh, if you, you can reverse anything he did in that period with a simple majority vote in the House and the Senate. Mm. So it's not eligible for filibuster. You only need 50 votes, which Biden has. Now, if he, if he does that, not only do you reverse anything Trump did with that vote, but you also stop any of those rules ever coming back ever again. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of scorching the earth a little bit, right? Yeah. And, and he can do that. So that, and he has a few, a few weeks to be able to do that. So look forward to that. That will, that will be... A, make a big difference in terms of what he reverses. An interesting Trump. check as well on presidential overreach because if you play that Trump card, no pun intended, mm. then it's gone. You yeah. burnt it. So yeah. You can't use it again. And as well, if you're just trying to figure out what is the difference between presidential executive power and congressional yes. power, simple rule of thumb, Congress has the power of the purse strings. So the president can do pretty much anything they want to as long as it doesn't cost money. If they want money, they have to go to Congress to appropriate that. So, for instance, the president can fire off a nuclear missile but once that missile's been, you know, fired at Canada, he has to go back to Congress to say, I've used all my nuclear missiles, I'd like you to buy me a new one. <laughs> and Congress then gets to decide if they spend money on a nuclear missile or not. Bad analogy, I'm sorry. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen in reality. <laughs> um, I will say, though, that if Biden wants to ban people wearing masks on federal property, like mm. you were saying, he probably should have some words to his press secretary, Jen Psaki, who explained the situation just after Biden signed the executive order this way. Doing a mask mandate that will require anyone visiting a federal building or federal land or using certain modes of public transportation to wear a mask. There's no more federal building than the White House, is there? That's right. Fox <laughs> News loved that one, let me yeah, tell you. Bet they did. But uh, to what will undoubtedly dominate Biden's legislative agenda for the next few months? COVID. We should start with a big update on just how much of a mess America is in there since we went on holiday. As you can see, America has been hovering between 200 and 250,000 new cases a day since we went on holiday two months ago. Over 25 million Americans have now tested positive for COVID. Those numbers are beginning to drop. That's nice. But that's just as the super contagious UK and South African strains of COVID have come onto the scene. So those numbers may yet rise again. Now to compare to other countries with more than a million people. America has now registered the second most cases per capita on the planet, with 7.5% of the population having had COVID. Although these days a lot of the other bad countries aren't from South America like they were in November. They're now the second wave countries from Europe. 
Hospitalizations are at 125,000. That's still more than twice the level at the peak of the first wave. But they have dropped slightly from 131,000 last week. Obviously, what counts the most, though, is deaths. And there have been between 2,500 and 4,000 deaths a day for two months now. We're up to over 400,000 deaths in total. To put that in context, more people died from COVID in the first two weeks of this year than in eight of the last 10 entire flu seasons. As far as the world goes, America has the eighth highest deaths per capita rate in the world amongst countries with more than a million people. Interestingly, the entire rest of the top 10 is made up of second wave European countries. They're struggling badly over there. So none of that is good news, and neither is it good that there are 12 states that have more than 15% of their COVID tests returning positive, with Oklahoma over 20% of tests. Bear in mind, you want those numbers to be more like 5%. But of course, there is another stat that people are interested in today, that's vaccines. America is fifth there, with about 5% as many vaccine doses so far as people. But given America started earlier than most countries with vaccines, that's not ideal. America's got distribution issues. They've got trouble actually getting the vaccines to the people who need them most. There's a bunch of people out there who still don't want to be vaccinated. In fact, in one California hospital, only 40% of the employees agreed to get their shots. In a hospital, they end up having to bribe them with $300 payments to get vaccinated. In a hospital. And fixing this has become a real focus for the Biden administration. They reckon that the Trump administration had a complete lack of a vaccine distribution strategy and they'd have to start from square one because there simply was no plan. Now, to be fair, Biden's ambitious target is 100 million doses in 100 days, i.e. a million doses a day. And the current seven-day average after Trump is... Uh, 912,000 shots a day. That's their target. So there, there might be some spinning going on there from Team Biden. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty sensible, though, politically, to set an achievable target right off the bat. In fact, it's a target that they are clearly going to want to exceed. Although President Biden is managing expectations today, saying this is going to take months to turn around. His One of his long-time advisers, Ted Kaufman, saying that uh, you should, we should be thinking of this as planning for D-Day rather than fighting Pearl Harbour. This is something that is still a long way off before we get on top of it. Well, with their target, they're talking the end of the year. Yeah. So it's, it's, it is a fair way off. Either way, Biden's pushing what they call the American Rescue Plan to deal with this kind of stuff. And this is so urgent that Democrats reckon they're going to have it drafted by early March. I'm not sure why that requires six weeks to get going, but basically it's a massive $1.9 trillion bill that bumps up those stimulus checks another $1,400 per eligible person, keeps extended unemployment benefits, rental assistance and paid leave going until September, spreads some love to state governments and schools, subsidizes childcare centres that have been getting hammered during the pandemic, and it also establishes a national testing and a national vaccination program, rather than relying on ad hoc state systems that currently exist. He also wants to spend about $40 billion more on medical supplies. Now, that's all a super summary. I'll go into more detail on the podcast. But what do you think of it all, John? Well, I guess in simple terms, what Joe Biden is saying is, unlike President Trump, who took a hands-off approach to handling the coronavirus pandemic, said essentially to the states, you're on your own. And so you had crazy situations where California and Alabama were bidding against each other for, for PPE and ventilators and so on. Instead, Joe Biden is saying we're going to mobilise the federal government to coordinate all of this, particularly important when it comes to rolling out the vaccine, doing administrative things like re-registering doctors and nurses who've retired. Their licences have lapsed, but we now want them putting jabs in millions of arms. Part of the reason for the delay, though, in that next round of potential stimulus, that top-up stimulus, $1,400, is Republicans are still saying, well, we just gave them 600 bucks before Christmas. We don't yet know how that's going to flow into the economy. Maybe that other money is not going to be needed after all. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting that balance right. Every week that passes builds the pressure uh, for the argument that says we need more help or maybe says, you know what, 
things are levelling out a little bit. Maybe we can save a bit of money. So that's that's part of it. It's the power of the purse strings, Chaz. Well, they've got plenty of weeks to play with. They do. <laughs> now, Joe Biden's hopes of getting any legislation passed through this Congress did get a big boost earlier in the month when Democrats won both of the Senate runoff elections in Georgia. Reverend Raphael Warnock, who preaches at the same Ebenezer Baptist Church as Martin Luther King once did, became the first African-American senator ever elected from the state of Georgia. He defeated appointed Republican Kelly Leffler and 33-year-old former journalist John Ossoff defeated incumbent Republican Senator David Perdue. Although Joe Biden did win Georgia narrowly last November, yes, he did, <laughs> Democrats were not confident that they could pick up one, let alone both, of these Senate seats. And this does now put the United States Senate on a knife edge. 48 Democrats plus two independents who caucus with them and 50 Republicans, so 50-50. Vice President Kamala Harris has the casting vote to decide if there is a tie. And that also gives a lot of power to the moderates on both sides, Democrats like Joe Manchin, of West Virginia, Kirsten Sinema and Mark Kelly of Arizona. On the Republican side, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Mikowski of Alaska, possibly the conservative but generally collegial Mitt Romney of Utah could come into play. Warnock, Ossov and the new senator from California, Alex Padilla, were sworn in yesterday by the old senator from California, VP Kamala Harris. And a certificate of appointment to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of former... Senator Kamala D. Harris of California. <laughs> yeah, that was very weird. Okay. <laughs> It was a little bit weird. <laughs> it's good to see at least the President of the Senate not mispronouncing Kamala Harris's name. Yeah, it's the first time for everything. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, there is a bit of a wild card actually with the Senate, which I don't think a lot of people have hit on yet. And that is, you mentioned Lisa Murkowski as one of the moderate Republicans. Yes. She may not be a moderate Republican for long, and I'll tell you why. Oh. The Alaskan electoral system changed in, in, after 2020 so that now they have a completely different system to anywhere else in America. The way it is now, instead of having primaries where you appeal to the base of your party to, to get a nomination, now they're going to have uh, open top four primaries, as in everyone from all parties competes against each other, the top four go through. Now, Lisa Murkowski has been a senator for decades. She has huge name recognition, which means she'll be in the top four for sure. No matter what happens, no matter what party she is, she'll be in the top four. So she doesn't need to compete uh, with, uh, uh, with other Republicans for the Republican base. Mm. She will just go through to the general election. Then in the general election, they have rank choice voting. That's preferential voting, like our system, Australia, which means rather than appealing to either extreme, they're appealing for the moderates. So then the, the independents and the moderates will put her number one, and then they'll put their party number two, which is what happens in Australia. That's why people go for the, for the centre in Australia. Now, that means there's no incentive for Mikowski to appeal to the base in the Senate. So let's say she votes against... Donald Trump in the impeachment trial yep. and Republicans go feral, she can just say, see you later. She's going to get re-elected anyway. In yep. fact, they almost guarantee her re-election. So there's every incentive for her to potentially become an independent and caucus with the Democrats, and then they'd have 51 seats. Well, it's worked very well for independents uh, Bernie Sanders and Angus King, mm. who caucus with the Democrats. They've increased their leverage much more. For Lisa Murkowski, uh, great that there's this m moderating force in American politics. I hope there's going to be more of it. I think we underappreciate it in our own country, just mm. what an effect it has. Uh, but for Lisa Murkowski, of course, she got knocked off in a Republican primary not that many years ago by a kind of Tea Party conservative Republican. Mm. She was then made a write-in candidate and she won. That meant she wasn't even on the ballot. People had to fill in her name on the ballot and she still won. So Lisa Murkowski, yes, big, uh, big name recognition in Alaska if she goes independent or whether she just remains an independent Republican, it's clearly still going to work for her. Now, it was just four years ago, in fact, that Kamala Harris became the only the second woman of colour to ever be elected to the United States Senate, now the first female VP of any colour. The first African-American senator uh, to be a woman, Carol Mosley Braun. She was elected to the state of Illinois in 1992. Carol Mosley Braun joins us from Washington, D.C., where she's been for the inauguration this week. Ambassador, welcome back to Planet America. Thank you for inviting me. 
I'm really interested to know, what was going through your mind yesterday as you were seeing Joe Biden, your old colleague, taking the oath of office, and Kamala Harris as well, of course? I was over the moon about both, about the whole event, and frankly, almost didn't get there because Washington is right now kind of an armed camp. Uh, you've got military and police everywhere. Uh, and so I couldn't get I couldn't get a car to get me from my hotel to the ceremony. And so I wound up walking 15 blocks in heels because it was really an extraordinary experience. I was over the moon uh, uh, with regard to both Joe and with Kamala um, uh, getting sworn in as the president and vice president of the United States, particularly since we've just come through such a really horrible, horrible period for our country and for the world. And so they have offered hope and sunshine. In fact, a little while Joe was giving his address, the sun came out. It was really quite, you know, it was almost like magical. Clearly you have this historic connection to Kamala Harris and her place in history as well. How important is this moment for the women of America? Well, you know, I, she is the second uh, woman of color, second black woman to be in the United States Senate. She's the first woman of color or woman, period, uh, uh, to be a vice president. And so we are all just so excited because this is the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote in the United States. We've only been voting for 100 years here. And so um, uh, the fact that we now have a female vice president is really extraordinary. Um, women uh, have struggled for the vote and we got it 100 years ago and now we have a vice president. So it's really, really a very important moment. What was the mood like there with that huge military lockdown? Did it cast a large shadow over the proceedings? It actually did not. And that was, that was really one of the more curious things. Everybody, because of the pandemic, everybody was really kind of prepared for the military uh, uh, occupation. Um, uh, and so while, and, and, and they were all very nice, by the way. The soldiers were all very nice. In fact, I mentioned I walked 15 blocks. One of them saved me. He actually, when I thought I was gonna pass out, he stopped it, stopped his Humvee and gave me a lift to the Capitol. So they have been, um, they are really an overwhelming presence all, all over the city. But after the insurrection or the attempted coup of uh, two weeks ago, uh, it, 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 nobody is surprised by it. And so um, you'd think it would put a damper on things, but it really did not. I mean, everybody, I think, was so excited to see this inauguration of a new administration uh, for our country and uh, that, that that overcame everything. So how optimistic are you about the next four years in America? And by the way, what does an optimistic result actually look like? Well, an optimistic result looks like, A, getting past this pandemic. Uh, uh, there has been no leadership in this country in terms of coordinating the different layers and levels of government with the private sector to get people vaccinated. And that's right out the gate. That's one of Joe's priorities, uh, or Joe Biden's priority, President Biden's. Oh, I can't believe I just said that. That's wonderful, President Biden's priorities. So, um, uh, so getting in front of the pandemic, because until that happens, um, we won't be able to heal the economy. He also talked about engaging with the world another, uh, again. I mean, the executive order he signed yesterday, rejoining the World Health Organization, uh, saying we were going to start collaborating with our friends again uh, as a country, uh, really pointed in a very positive direction in terms of external relations with other people, with other countries. Um, and so once he gets the economy going, then he wants to attack the climate. And so he has um, a group, including John Kerry, who was one of my former colleagues, on climate change. So he's going to build back better. He's going to create jobs through tackling climate change and tackling the problems that we face. So he's got a big agenda. And from your personal experience with now President Joe Biden, what do you think he brings to this job? One, obviously, that he has come to very, very late in his political career. You know, this is yesterday, among my thoughts yesterday uh, for the inauguration was one joy for Joe because he this is his third try for president and it finally worked out for him. He actually won. Um, but second, that um, that I was sadness because, and the sadness was that this was not an inauguration such as the previous inaugurations have been. Normally, it's a huge party. 
and so this time, however, is much more somber, much more focused in on government and making government work for people. And um, not to mention the military presence, you know, all these you had different layers of military. We had the National Guard, we had these, the Metropolitan Police, we had the FBI, we had the um, uh, Secret Service, we had the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and I mean, there were, there were cops everywhere. <laughs> and not to mention burns and barricades. So that's why I had to walk those, I, I must have walked 15 miles in high heels yesterday to try to get to the Capitol for the inauguration. Um, but that's why, because cars couldn't move through the city. And, um, and so I think that Joe is going to, I mean, it's like the sun came out during his speech. It's like the sun coming out for the whole country. And I hope for the whole world. Carol Mosley Braun, many thanks indeed for being with us again. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, it's been an action-packed first week back, Chaz, but As... we do have time for a fireside chat. We've got Joe Biden in the White House, Donald Trump in some condominium on a Florida <laughs> golf course, and the US Senate is now trying to decide whether to convict the former president following his impeachment for inciting an insurrection. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she will send the article of impeachment soon, but the exact timetable uncertain. In a call to Republican senators earlier on today, Mitch McConnell said that he wanted to give President Trump two weeks to prepare his defence. This will be a very, very different Senate trial, though, Chaz, to the one that we had 12 months ago when Democrats did not have the numbers, so Republicans could force uh, there to be no witnesses, no evidence heard in the Senate trial. So if in that limited evidence that is likely to be heard, we get some kind of smoking gun implicating President Trump even more than his own words in front of the cameras implicated him, we could see a big problem for the former president. Meanwhile, the... Uh, the Senate Democrats also earlier today filed ethics complaints against Republican Senators Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley for their role in inciting that insurrection. There's talk of the 14th Amendment being invoked to boot them out of the Senate as well. So kind of a weird contrast, all of that going on while President Biden is saying, but we must work together, we must be united. <laughs> we must overcome partisanship in the national interest. What do you make of all of that? Well, first of all, uh, you're right. It's a very different kind of trial when the Democrats are in charge than when the Republicans are in charge. But I'm not sure how many witnesses they're going to call when we also heard today that apparently Democrats are talking about potentially a three-day trial in total. Mm. Because Biden wants to move on. Well, that's on. three days longer than the House impeachment was. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. But, yeah, but Biden, yeah, Biden is uh, saying he wants to move on. And I understand why he wants to move on. That makes sense. But you can't call all the witnesses in three days. So, I, yeah, it, it may be really quick. It might, might, be, it might be a one-and-done type scenario. Yeah. Uh, so, so it, I don't know if it's necessarily going to... It, you kind of wonder why, if there's even a point yeah. if it's going to be that short. Well, the likes of Jamie Raskin, House member from Maryland who's running the, the, the prosecution, the Democratic case for the Senate, they're gathering a lot of evidence now. They're going to have a lot of written testimony. Mm. I guess they're kind of just hoping for an open and shut case to say... Well, here it is. Look at these words. This amounts to incitement. We say guilty. And it really just comes down to whether Mitch McConnell says, you know what, this is rather convenient as a way of making sure that Donald Trump never leaves that Florida golf resort. Do you think, let's, let's, let's sign up to this. Do you think there's any chance that Mitch McConnell would actually vote to convict? Because the, 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 re, the thing which I keep on thinking is we know Mitch McConnell doesn't like Trump very much. He yep. probably wants him to go away. Yep. But if he had the numbers... He wouldn't be delaying. He wouldn't be delaying two weeks now. He wouldn't have been delaying a week from when the House first pulled the, pulled the pin. Mm. He would have gone for the vote straight away if he thought he had them. And so yeah. the fact he hasn't makes me think that he doesn't have the numbers. Well, I guess the other way to look at that is the Democrats now have three extra Senate votes yeah. uh, as a result of Ossoff Warnock and Padilla being in there. Uh, Kamala Harris will have the casting vote if there is... Uh, a tie. She won't get to vote if they're looking at 67 votes for the two-thirds majority. But at the end of the day, look, Mitch McConnell, who knows? He's a, he's a, a wily political operator and uh, maybe he does a deal. Maybe we convict uh, Donald Trump and uh, we, we only sign a trillion-dollar stimulus package rather than a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Mm. Horse trading is going to begin. It, it is. And the one thing that, that, that makes me think that maybe there is a chance of a conviction, just a chance, is the Republicans are distancing themselves from Trump quite rapidly, more rapidly than I thought they would. In fact, National Review noted that out of 201 Republican fundraising emails over the last two weeks, 
only eight of those 201 mentioned Trump. Donald who? Yeah, more fundraising emails mention CNN's Jake Tapper. So they, so they are distancing themselves, but this is a massive task to fully divorce a party from a leader that still 92% of his supporters want him to be the 2024 candidate, according to Axios. Sean Hannity's made it very clear to Mitch McConnell that uh, even the slightest hint of an anti-Trump scent, and they're out of here. Mitch, I will give you an A-plus on getting constitutionalist judges on the bench. Been great on judges, but frankly, it looks like it's time now. If you're going to go along with all of this nonsense, we need new leadership in the U.S. Senate. Americans want somebody that will fight for their values and principles, not scheme behind closed doors with your buddy Chucky e. Schumer. I think Chucky e. Schumer would be surprised to hear that. <laughs> but if you want a little bit of a hint as to how Mitch McConnell may be thinking, after the insurrection on Capitol Hill, Elaine Chow, Mitch McConnell's wife, Transport Secretary, she resigned in protest over the President's handling. So, who knows? As expected, Donald Trump did spend much of his final day in office issuing a series of pardons, clemencies and commutations, notable as much for the names that were not on the final list as those who were. There were 70 full pardons and 73 sentences commuted. Former Trump adviser Steve Bannon, who stood accused of ripping off donors to a private fundraising effort to build a border wall. Elliot Brody, a Trump mega donor and unregistered foreign agent, who also paid a million and a half dollars in hush money to a woman who had a pregnancy terminated Many reports suggesting that was actually paid on Trump's behalf. And Albert Pirro, Trump's former lawyer who was sentenced to two years jail for tax evasion, he's also received a pardon. He's the ex-husband, of course, of Judge Jadine Pirro of Fox News, one of the biggest Trump boosters anywhere on the airwaves. Dwayne Michael Carter Jr., better known to you, I'm sure, as rapper Lil Wayne, he was also forgiven for historic firearms charges. But Chaz, amongst those not given pardons or even preemptive pardons, well, Trump didn't try and pardon himself. He didn't try and pardon anyone named Trump. Uh, he didn't pardon uh, Joe Maladono Passage, a.k.a. Joe Exotic, the Tiger King reality TV star who's in jail for 22 years for crimes against wildlife. You'll know what I'm talking about if you've seen the show. Joe's supporters were so convinced that Trump was going to sign a pardon for him, apparently. They had a limousine and a camera crew waiting outside the jail and the pardon did not come. What do you make of, of this? I mean, we were expecting a few names that weren't there. Yeah, look, it, it could have been worse, mm. as you say, with the family and all the, all the rest. But first of all, we should say there were some good pardons there, some really good pardons, like some people who had been convicted for life imprisonment for, say, possession of marijuana and stuff. Mm. Like, there were some good ones there. But then the Steve Bannon one was particularly egregious because he didn't pardon Steve Bannon's buddies who were in on the same scheme. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between Steve Bannon and the other guys who did the same thing? The difference is Steve Bannon is a crony. Yeah. So that's pretty bad. And also... One estimate, 50% of all pardons in the Trump administration over the four years, 50% of them were people who had direct ties to Donald Trump or his political interests. Yeah, the, the, the other thing which I, I noted, but there were five pardons by my count of just outright corruption from politicians, like outright corrupt politicians mm -hmm. caught in the act. Yep. Some of them are Democrats, and, the, and they were pardoned for some reason. I, I, my mind goes back to the week before the pardon mm. when we heard that Trump was offering pardons for potentially $2 million, and yep. I just thought to myself... Hmm. They're interesting ones. Yeah, I wonder if they'll be investigated. On the, on the issue of ethics as well, after coming to power... Drain the Don swamp. <laughs> Donald Trump said, OK, we're going to have a five-year ban on people going out of an administration, oh, Obama's yeah. administration. They're banned for five That's years bad. from becoming a lobbyist in yeah. Washington, D.C. One of his final acts, well, we'll get rid of that. That's fine. <laughs> so, Kellyanne Conway, anybody at all, can now become a lobbyist, well, yesterday. Yeah. Now, finally this week, uh, President Trump may be considering a political comeback, but not as a Republican, as the head of a new party. The Wall Street Journal yesterday reporting that Mr Trump discussed the matter with several aides and other people close to him. The President said he would call the new party the Patriot Party. So he's already got a name for this Trump party. I'm amazed he's not calling it the Trump party, though, Chaz. Has he got a chance? Is this, could this be a, 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 either a spoiler or is it not actually about winning? Is it about the money? What do you think? I think that's a great way to become irrelevant, to start a third party that isn't going anywhere. But all I would say is if he wants to start a third party, he shouldn't talk about it while the Senate Republicans are deciding 
whether they will disqualify him for running for <laughs> any party That's a good in point. the Senate trial. You should be a lobbyist. That is all from Planet <laughs> America this week. Join us next Friday night at 8pm Eastern on ABC News. That is our new regular hour-long slot for 2021. So set the VCR. That is a very Joe Biden appropriate technology reference, John. <laughs> but before we go, this photo of the even older Bernie Sanders than Joe Biden at the inauguration <laughs> set off a flood of memes online this week. We ask you to send us your Favourites? Enjoy. No. No, no.